which is why A16Z passed on Uber. And so this one's crazy because Uber should have been easy. You know, Benchmark led the Series A despite strong interest from Sequoia, you know, signaling strong institutional investor desire. I mean, Benchmark and Sequoia are 1A and 1B in 2012. You know, if they're saying yes to this deal, that's a good sign. And so Uber was growing like a weed or a weed on steroids. <laughs> and most notably about all of this, you know, not only was it growing like crazy, not only did institutional investors you know, love Uber, A16Z was Uber CEO Travis Kalanick's first choice for an investor to lead the Series B and to take a board seat. He was adamant that A16Z partner Jeff Jordan joins their board to go along with Bill Gurley to make this incredible superstar board. So he wanted A16Z, which is crazy because typically the investors have to appeal to the founders. Like they have to sell themselves for the founders. Once they hit this moment of like product market fit, you could you have a strong indication that they're going to be successful. So then the firm has to sell to the founder rather than the founder selling to the firm. And so Travis could have likely gone with any institutional investor. I'd assume most were eager to invest in Uber, but Travis wanted, Travis wanted A16Z. He wasn't really taking too many meetings. He was focused on A16Z. So, you know, what happened? How, why did A16Z not invest in Uber? Well, interestingly enough, Mark Andreessen had originally signaled to Kalnick that A16Z would invest at a $300 million valuation, which was competitive with other firms, which is interesting because, you know, A16Z, at least initially, you know, wasn't going to use Travis's eagerness to sign with them to lower their valuation. You know, if one VC firm is offering 300, Travis wants to go with A16Z, they could probably give something like 275 and Travis would still go with them because of the power that Jeff Jordan holds as a board member. But they were offering 300 million. They were offering the market price, a fair price. And then something completely bizarre happened. When Travis Kalanick and Mark Andreessen met over dinner to discuss the deal, Andreessen claimed that Uber's customer numbers and revenues weren't high enough to demand a $300 million valuation. So Andreessen revised his offer to a $220 million valuation. I mean, that's a huge 27% price cut on the deal. That's not slight. That is massive. And so Kalanick tried to persuade Andreessen to meet him halfway at $260 million. Still a big price cut, but Andreessen wouldn't budge. And so Kalanick accepted a $290 million valuation from Menlo Ventures instead to lead the Series B. So obviously, 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 hindsight is 2020. So, you know, it's easy to criticize A16Z and it's not completely fair. But man, if you haven't read my essay or listened to my episode on why Benchmark invested in Uber, you know, you'll see why anyone should have been extremely bullish on the company. Now, I understand that sometimes valuations are high and can give investors pause. But like I've mentioned before, a trend we consistently see, and I think every essay I've covered, is that a high valuation is typically a signal to invest. So unless you don't want to invest in the company at all, then don't take the high valuation, obviously. But if you want to invest in the company, like you, you, you believe in the product, you believe in the vision, you believe in the market, it's worth coughing up a high valuation because typically that's actually a good sign if you're looking at history. You know, it's a tough pill to swallow, but typically it pays off, especially if that company has the customer retention numbers that Uber had at that time. You know, maybe it wasn't growing as much as Andreessen hoped it would or initially thought it would, but man, its customer retention was incredible, which in my opinion is certainly one of the most valuable metrics to look at. And so A16Z kind of learned from their mistakes and returned about a billion dollars on their investment in Lyft a few years later. But Menlo Ventures, who led the Uber Series B, returned somewhere between three and three and a half billion dollars on their Uber investment on much less invested capital. 
I don't know how much exactly, but let's say Andreessen made a 10x on Lyft, Menlo probably made somewhere between a 50 to a 200x on Uber. And you know, also if that's not enough, if you think one billion and three billion isn't that different because they're both billions and one and three aren't that different, I can assure you that one to three billion is a massive difference. Not only just in dollar amounts, but also as a VC firm, you know, for your LPs, for raising future funds. So I can assure you that Mark Andreessen and the A16Z team are very much kicking themselves over that mistake to this day. So the next one we're going to talk about here today is why A16Z passed on Square. So this one was hard to find information on, but in 2012, Mark Andreessen mentioned that this was his biggest investing mistake. All he said was he and his team overthought the deal and they should have just said to themselves, Jack Dorsey, check and write the check, which I love that quote. And so this is a similar situation to what we just touched on with Slack. You know, A16Z's decision to keep investing in Slack after it pivoted from tiny spec was because of Stuart Butterfield. It was because of the founder. And most investors say early stage investing is 70 to 80% about the founders, but some investors say it's 100% about the founders. Now, some C stage investors don't care about anything else except their reading on the founder. So when you're debating an investment that's led by a proven and exceptional founder in Jack Dorsey, who, if you don't know, somehow was a founder of Twitter, that's a pretty risk averse investment to make. So I'm assuming since you know Square was a risk averse investment, it was demanding a high valuation because of Jack Dorsey, but Square was going after a market in digitizing point of sale transactions for small businesses that were still relying on taking cash. So the problem was clear and the market was there. And this problem was being attacked by a proven founder known as a genius who could attract incredible employees and incredible future investors. And so opportunities like this are ones to jump on if given the chance. You know, sometimes it's that simple to make an investment. As Andreessen mentioned, you know, Jack Dorsey, check, make the investment. <laughs> the hard part in these situations, as I've come to find, is overthinking an investment to the point of talking yourself out of the deal. You know, sometimes it's so easy to just be like, yes, that when you really look under the covers and you look more and more and more, you could just find more reasons to say no, and eventually that could take over your mind, despite you know that initial inclination of just to invest. Because early stage investing, you can always find more reasons not to invest than to invest. So sometimes there's one signal to invest, but that signal could far and above outweigh the 50 ex <laughs> signals showing you not to invest. So food for thought there. So the last one we're gonna cover today in a different rendition of the anti-portfolio section is why A16Z passed on FTX. And so if this is your first episode, typically this is a section where we, you know, learn lessons from mistakes venture capital firms make. But for several reasons, I had to put FTX in this section just to give A16Z their flowers. Maybe, you know, the benchmark Sequoia and Kleiner Perkins founders or partners listening to this episode will be annoyed that I only said two negative things about Andreessen rather than three, like I did for them. But if you are listening, Bill Gurley, I'm sorry, I'm going to do FTX here. So this is interesting because A16Z was leading the charge of large scale institutional investors investing in crypto. They invested in Coinbase in 2013 and A16Z partner, Chris Dixon, became one of the faces of the crypto movement. And Andreessen Horowitz raised several crypto focused funds. They invested in a lot of different products. They were they were the crypto VC firm in a large scale. You know, many were just focused on crypto, but hundred multi hundred million dollar funds investing in crypto, that was only A16Z. So all signs pointed to A16Z investing in FTX, you know, if given the chance. And apparently they were pitched to several times by the crypto exchange, by FTX and its founder, Sam Bankman-Fried. And so A16Z, 
Now, obviously, has never directly said why they passed. I'm sure they just want to keep their mouth shut about this whole situation. But one glaring reason one could assume to be true as to why they passed is because they were investors in Coinbase, like we talked about. So they were probably conflicted out of investing in FTX since it was basically a direct competitor. So maybe that was it. Maybe they were like, oh, this is... I wish we could invest in FTX, but we're in Coinbase, so we're sticking with Coinbase. But according to some reports, A16Z also didn't trust Sam Bankman-Fried. They thought he was a little sketchy, which is, you know, turned out to be true. And the lack of a traditional board of directors and not being based in the U.S. raised concerns as well. It's like they're seeing in the future here <laughs> because you can't trust Bankman-Fried. There was basically no board of directors. And since they weren't in the U.S., they could just do all kind of sketchy accounting and tax evasion and so on and so forth. So, you know, maybe most of this is hindsight. Maybe they're, you know, inadvertently tooting their own horn. Perhaps they wanted to invest and were conflicted out of Coinbase and are now just saying these things to, you know, feel a little better about themselves. But maybe they were actually one of the few firms who just didn't fall for the act. And the concerns, you know, I mentioned were actually apparent in their mind. Regardless of why they passed, A16Z passed on FTX, while other investors like Sequoia, Lightspeed, Tiger Global, NEA, more and more and more practiced just negligent due diligence and wanted to just join the crypto craze and got their opportunity by investing in FTX. So whether they actually had a choice to invest in FTX or not, I mean, they took a meeting, so they might have had a choice. Regardless, it's worth commending A16Z for not investing. And let this be a reminder to all listening that proper due diligence is necessary when investing. Stern evaluation of the founder is critical regardless of the hype around the company or the team. And pick your winners diligently because... You know, while you may be conflicted out of some winners by investing in them, as we recently touched on with Benchmark Missing Facebook because of their Friendster investment, you may also just be lucky enough to get conflicted out of some major losers after you pick the right winner. 